When you study medieval construction long enough, you notice something that doesn't make sense. Entire barns from the 13th century are still standing with their original beams. Viking docks that spent their lives half-submerged haven't turned to mush. Frontier villages built with crude hand tools outlast modern cabins assembled with pressure-treated lumber and a truckload of chemicals. And you know, when you get close, run your hand over the grain and look at the colour of the wood. The secret starts to reveal itself. Medieval builders weren't just chopping down trees and hoping for the best. They were manipulating wood at a level most people today don't even realise is possible. They understood moisture, season, sap, tannins, fire and soil chemistry better than many of us with all our modern gear. They didn't think of the forest as a resource. They treated it like a living laboratory. And what's wild is this. Their methods still work every bit as effectively today. If you're a survivalist, a homesteader, a historian, or someone who simply respects ancient craftsmanship, understanding this medieval anti-rot system gives you an entirely new skill set. This wasn't magic. It wasn't superstition. It was raw, testable, repeatable engineering from people who depended on wood the way we depend on electricity. So let's break down exactly how they made rot-proof timber, why it worked, and how you can apply the same practices today with only basic tools. The process begins long before the tree is ever cut down, because medieval builders understood that timing was everything. Medieval carpenters were picky about when a tree died. They didn't cut in spring or summer because the sap was up, sugars were high, and rot-causing fungi thrive on that material. They cut during the deep, cold months, typically from November to early February, when the sea ape retreated and the moisture content inside the wood hit its lowest natural point. A winter-felled tree is already halfway preserved the moment it hits the ground. You know, you can actually replicate this today by timing your own felling or, well, by harvesting reclaimed logs only from trees cut in the cold season. If you do end up cutting year-round, at least let the wood age long enough for the sap to drain and, you know, for the excess moisture to exit. Even just a few months of proper seasoning can reduce the risk of early decay dramatically. Removing the sapwood and prioritising the heartwood was, in fact, the medieval equivalent of selecting premium lumber. Sapwood is the pale outer ring of a tree. Heartwood is the darker inner core. Medieval builders knew the sapwood rotted fast, so they stripped as much of it as possible. Heartwood is naturally loaded with oils, minerals and tannins that resist insects and fungi. Oak, chestnut, larch and cedar were prized specifically because their heartwood is packed with natural preservatives. If you want medieval-grade durability today, select species with high tannin content or use reclaimed old-growth wood when you can find it. For projects like posts, sills and beams, carve away the sapwood just like medieval carpenters did. It takes more time, but it can add decades to the lifespan of the structure. Waterproofing began with a surprising step. They burned the surface on purpose. One of the most misunderstood medieval techniques is controlled charring, especially for ground posts. Builders lightly burned the outer surface, creating a carbon layer that insects hated and moisture couldn't easily penetrate. This wasn't deep burning. 
It was a thin shell of charcoal, sealed later with natural oils or pitch. Japanese builders used the same method, called Shosugi Ban, and it works just as well today. If you want to test this yourself, just take a fence post char the lower two feet until the surface turns black and flaky scrape the loose bits off and then coat it with pine tar or boiled linseed oil. You'll end up with a post that, well, lasts many years longer than store-bought treated lumber. Medieval communities used the forest's own chemistry, especially tannin-rich bogs, to create wood that was both hardened and preserved. Bog oak is famous today, but medieval people didn't treat it as a curiosity. They intentionally submerged timber into oxygen-poor, tannin-rich wetlands to halt rot and harden the fibres. The tannins bonded with the cellulose, turning the wood almost stone-like. This wasn't a quick process. It could take years. But for high-value structures, it was worth the wait. You can replicate a miniature version by soaking wood in a high tannin solution made from boiled oak bark, or, well, even strong tea. It doesn't produce true bog oak, but it does load the timber with tannins that resist rot. Coating wood with tar, pitch or oil was the final shield medieval builders relied on. You'll see this over and over in historical records. Timber coated in pine tar, birch tar, or a mix of oil and resin. These coatings acted like medieval waterproofing membranes. They're still used today by craftsmen who, honestly, refuse to rely on synthetic chemicals. So, a practical modern method is honestly quite simple. You just warm pine tar until it thins out, then mix in a little boiled linseed oil to make it easier to work with, and brush it on. After that, let the wood soak it up in the sun, and then, well, apply a second layer. This technique was used on everything from Viking ships to medieval barns, and believe it or not, it's still one of the very best natural preservatives you can make at home. Bringing medieval woodcraft into modern survival means using their techniques with modern precision. If you're building a shelter, start by selecting dense resin-rich species like cedar or larch. Fell in the cold season if possible. Strip or carve back sapwood on critical pieces. Char any wood that touches soil. Coat everything with natural tar once it's dry. For long-term projects, add a high tannin soak step. These aren't gimmicks. They are the reason medieval Europe still has timber frame buildings standing straight as the day they were built. If guides like this deepen your respect for historical craftsmanship, make sure to subscribe to Warfield Survival, drop a comment, and share this with someone who loves real history backed by real techniques.